I lost, Scotty. I don't know where your motorcycle is. <laughs> and it's in the shop. Scotty, do Scotty. Um, I'm about to read this book from page 171. Ah, uh, it is a uh, little Roman book right here. Get ready to go to part. Oh, physical therapy. Sweet. Healing energy to Scotty's arm. Shoulder. Alright, so we got. Let's see. Where were we? Months in fact, tried by experiment and research. In the meantime, a sardonic cuckoo is scrambling alabars, cooters, nest eggs, replacing them with obnoxious slangs of its own. What? I don't remember this part. What did we? What happened last time? I'm not sure. Let's kind of go back a little bit. Since they couldn't afford to commission such a blend from the monks. Oh, okay, so last time they were trying to figure out a smell to cover up Pan's stink. Because Pan stinks. And they're hanging out with Pan. So Kudra and Alabar are these immortal beings that are hanging out with Pan. And Pan's kind of stinky and invisible. So no one can see him because no one believes in them anymore. But he kind of stinks. So they're trying to figure out a way to mask and stink with some good smell and stuff. And so far they found like jasmine, but it needs like something else with it and they can't figure it out to make it last. You know, the jasmine just doesn't last, but it covers it. So, now we're on this next chapter here on 171. Let's turn this music down because it's really loud. There we go. <coughs> Hopefully you caught some of that. That was kind of loud. At the appointed hour. No, but truly didn't work. They tried that too. At the appointed hour when quarter, quarters, quarters, quarters of Louis the, oh my gosh, I never learned Roman numerals, you guys. What is, what is XIV? XIV. Okay, is that like 5, 10, the 15th? Louis the 15th? Is that it? I don't know. We're finally to call at the shop to test its wares. Oh, they called on the shop. What is that? Pan returned prematurely from the stroll in the park. His malador at high mast due to exercise and the sappy influences of spring. Yeah, that's right. I said that. The courtiers, three in number, arrived on his heels. My goodness, said the first courtier. Courtier? Courtier? Quarter? Courtier. It's a strange word. You don't know? I don't know either. We'll get past it. <laughs> three in number arrived on his heels. My goodness. Wait. Snoot, said the second. Phew, said the third. Whatever credibility and sense may have held for them was immediately lost. Lost, too, was the most profitable market to which Kudra had ever aspired. Pan's lasting impression also cost their several smaller sales. It just cost them a lot, all right, because it just he stunk, that's all. And at this time, when the expenses were, expenses were on the rise... As the hunt for an effective bass note went on. Just, you know, for the smell. Dead rabbit! Come cafe! It's gotta be! In the midst of worrying about finances and Kudra's failure to conceive, none of his deposits seemed to earn interests. Alabar was stopped in the street one day by a neighbor monk, who inquired in the rude manner of children policemen and journalists if he and his wife employed heathen practices oh no the monk was no more peaceful wait no more specific than that but alabar instantly assumed the reference was to the longevity though he's getting run off for being immortal it sucks you mean like that old bandaloop methuselah he shot back as, and as the Christian brother gaggled the fourth of his bewilderment, he hurried away in a chilly sweat to warn Kudra, rightly or wrongly, that they'd been found out once again. Ah, they've got to get on the run again. 
get out of there. For all the reaction he got from Kudra, he might as well have told her that the poodle gods were pooping on the paths of... That's what I meant. She was up to her elbows in baskets of bark. The lepurous but fragrant epidermis of some African tree Rav un unraveling its history, reading its fortune, learning its language, its vocabulary of botanical suffering, coaxing from the ancient stories of iridescent pus that smelled of rains and nests of yellow fruit squashed beneath the feet of heavy animals. Yikes, that's pretty crazy right there. That's pretty descriptive, right? Yes. Of heavy animals. This could be it, she can find. Milking a single bead of resin rolled out of an ulcer. She was caught in a vial. She caught it in a vial. Jeez. Somewhere in Africa, a tree stood naked. This could be the one to support the jasmine. Little good will it do if the monks said opinions against us. When she neglected to respond, she said, Kudra, what is to be our next move? Express the bouquet from the resin. Hmm. No, no, no. Haven't you been listening? There may be trouble. There may be trouble over. Oh, that, she said. Well, Alabar, I have been thinking, she said. Another anguished crest of bark over the cradle frame flame. Wait. Another anguished crust of bark over the candle flame. Jeez, I can't seem to read today. Let me... Usually get warmed up by now. All right. Squeezing and pulling until its black boil popped out and bubbled the feverish exudation. Hard pearls of honey glistening as if in a prolonged delirium brought on by the persistence of time. I have been thinking that the altogether smartest thing would be to dematerialize and then rematerialize in the new world. It seems like a good idea. You don't see that would save us money and time. We would not require a sou for passage, nor would we be forced to bob about in the oceans with a horde of vomiting missionaries. Why, if Pan would dematerialize along with us, he is all but dear Miro dematerialized already. So, he would not even need to complete his perfume. Locating the perfect bass note may yet provide impossible. She sniffed unconfidedly at the wooden warts in her fingers. Kudra, we do not know how to determine D and re materialize. Then it's time we learned. Have we lived several hundred years for naught? Except for our longevity, we are no closer to the divine than our ordinary folk. Our practices have kept us alive, but they have not revealed to us any divine secret nor speck of the magic of the gods. She laid down the ugly chip and faced him. He commenced to wring his hands. Oh, jeez. Have you ever wringed your hands before? <sighs> Kudra, he whined. But for his age, Alabar, the great individualist, is just like any common man. Kudra, we don't know. What happened to the bold adventurer who seduced me in more ways than one up to the roof of the world? Kudra, you are talking death. I sense that you are. There is no death. There are only different levels of life. You must know that by now. You who ran away from the funeral pyre. How can you speak with such authority? dealing the bark basket a blow much as she'd once kicked a wicker of rope Kudra sent it spinning setting into motion a brief blizzard of sebaceous crumbs sebaceous crumbs sheesh sebias sebias damn you Halabar, for the blue piss of Kali how you frustrate me how could any man venture as far as you have and then be unwilling to go further. It is a failure of imagination that has snipped off your curiosity, or a failure of your nerve that leaves you so eager to settle for the one concession you have won from the fates. One concession, eh? You make it sound so trivial. 
Let me tell you something, Kudra. Each and every morning when I awake, my eyes brim with tears at the realization that I am still here breathing when all who shared my natal day have for half a millennium been dust. Each and every morning when I first see the dawn ray take your sleeping face tenderly in its tongs, I tremble in the kind of ecstasy that you and I continue to lie in love together, century after juicy century, while every other pair of lovers who have lived has had to helplessly watch their passion suffocate in the sags of this sticky flesh. Now that may strike you as some small unworthy thing. Kudra took his cheeks in her hands. She was clean shaven then, in the 17th century style and kissed him. She took her head from his side and to side, blinking back a few tears of her own. No, my darling, it strikes me as, strikes me as magnificent beyond description. <laughs> Again, she kissed him, but it happens not to be the end at all. If a person have a glass, does that mean he should refuse a bottle? If he have a bottle, does it mean he should not want wine? Come now. Darling, do not pull away, but hear me out. We have crossed the threshold of the house of divine knowledge, yet we linger in the afternoon, in the, wait, in the anteroom, admiring its wallpaper and shun the main chambers of the house. Why is it we resist exploring the mansion in which it has been our unique privilege to gain admission? Because, said answered Alabar, death is the master of that house. My ambition has been free myself from death, not to visit him in a parlor and share tea. Death is not a resident of the house. Death is merely the name we give to certain rooms of the house. Rooms that we, so-called living, fear for the simple reason that we have not passed through them. Alabar right the overturned basket and began to pick up pieces of bark. Again, my little refugee from Sauté, I must question your authority in such matters. Kudra wished them to tell him the truth about Lalo, the nymph that had run off from the mariner while Alabar and Greece had died. Wait. While Alabar was in Greece but had died, peacefully, happily, in the bed where Pan now slept, and she had attended Lalo's demise, and, indeed, had followed her out of her body, traveling with her for a ways into the white light of the other side, until a sudden thought of Alabar caused her to turn back. Her concept of death was altered thereafter, and she wished to tell Alabar about that, as well as, uh, but she had promised the, oh, she had promised the nymph to keep her secret, her passing. The world must not think of nymphs as aged or dying, said Lalo, for that runs counter to the girlish sexual things that are represented. Perhaps Lalo was vain to the end, but it must be noted that she carried about the world, even the modern world, whose replacement of cosmic order with a rigorous contest between would-be equals had helped her to kill her. Listen, said Gudra, when we were in the caves, we learned by experimenting, by trial and error guided by some intelligence, perhaps divine, that radiated from the minerals there. What harm would there be in experimenting with dematerialization here in our shop? It is a temple of Pan now. After all, I feel strongly that we will be guided once again. The divine energy doesn't limit itself to some caverns in India. It is everywhere. It is where everywhere open to it. Trust my intuition, Alabar. What harm to try. Why not? Well, all right, I shall consider it, grumbled Alabar. I just don't... Just don't... Long as it... Wait, what? Just so long as it does not involve aging. <laughs> she thumped him with a look of iron. Should the monks or any other folks start to trouble us before we have either discovered dematerialization or a base note for Pan's perfume, then I shall age fast and furiously with hesitation and you would be wise to follow suit. At that, the quarreling commenced all over again. <laughs> the quarreling chewed through the curtains, pierced the, ca the casements, and rattled over the cobblestones outside. How strange it must have sounded 
this quarreling about dematerialization, voluntarily aging, goat gods, and immortality, to a city that was primed for age of reason, a populace that was beginning to put Descartes before the horse. <laughs> Descartes before the horse. <laughs> da -dunch. Just like a little bum bum. Alright. <clears throat> I need a drink. Ah. So, I'm going to dematerialize and then rematerialize in the new world with Pan somehow. She's like, we could do it. Come on. We can do this. We got it. We got it. Come on. <clears throat> so, they might do it. They might find it. We'll find out maybe soon. Page 175. All right. See you later, Scotty. Also, just wanted to tell you very, very clear today. Nice. It's going to be a nice, beautiful day out there. It's beautiful. Although the contentions that matter can transcend. At will, it is material character that would have Descartes spinning in one or the other of his graves. A person who can believe in physical immortality is merely a step away. Chris! Wait, what? A person who can believe in physical immortality is merely a step away from believing in dematerialization. So there you go. <laughs> Kudra believed in it and was prepared to experiment. Halabar probably believed in it but was reluctant. Huh. Interesting. What? Oh, really? It's very clear. It's very clear today. Kudra believed. I'm just going to read a couple more pages here. I'll read the two more. Yeah, two more pages. Although the concentration that matters can transcend. These guys are trying to dematerialize. For two pages. Let me just try. Subatomic particles apparently de- and rematerialize fairly routinely. Dr. Danny Boy has written, some of them actually can be in two places at once. Their freedom from the normal confines of the space-time continuum is though thought to be the result of weird electricity, an intelligent, creative, playful, and unpredictable interaction among op oppositely charged entities in motion. On at least one occasion, Dr. Danny Boy has described those energized particles as fairies, and unfortunately there is doubt that he was speaking metaphorically, but again, he is Irish. And moreover, he swallowed in his day a lot of drugs. That's true. Uh, at any rate, Dr. Danny Boy continued, We ourselves are built of subatomic particles and the spaces in between them. And our organisms are electrically as well as chemically powered. Our cells, or something that occupies our cells, transmit an electrical pulse. When we breathe, bathe, eat, make love, we think... The way that Kudra and Alabar did. We alter the cellular amperage until we find ourselves vibrating at the frequencies of the eternal immortality. When integrated about how they can walk through flames without being burned, primitives have conveyed an anthropological wait, an anthropologists that they raise the vibratory level of their flesh to equal that of the fire. In like manner, then an adept might raise or lower his or her vibratory rate to match that of another dimension, thereby disappearing from our customary universe and popping up in the other, dematerializing. From his vantage point in the 20th century, Danny Boy was privileged to marshal a fair amount of scientific evidence that supposedly explains Alabar and Kudra's accomplishments. No doubt such data have their benefits if for no other reason 
than that. The couple's immortalitist methodology often sounds too simplistic to be feasible. The result was far too much dramatic in the process, even though, for all practical purposes, the result was the process. Whether guided by divine intelligence, as Kutcher suggested, or inspired in some supernatural fashion by the absent Vandaloop doctors, maybe the Vandaloop were agents of the divine intelligence, I don't know, or simply informed by their own intuition, she and Alabar devised during their residency in the caves, a program based upon the four elements, air, water, earth, and fire. If encouraged, Wiggs' Danny Boy would expound upon which element in turn, dealing how it legitimately manifested itself in Kudru and Alabar's program. Dr. Danny Boy is simply mad for the subject of immortality and will yak about it until cows come home, although the precise time and date of bovine arrival has yet to be reckoned to his satisfaction. At some later point, it might be rewarding to examine Danny Boy and his arguments for the moment. Let it suffice to say that he is connected to air, connected air to breath, water to bath, earth to food, and fire to sex, supplying a mixture of empirical fact and medical theory to support his case with life-extending properties of his quartet. When ritualistically and resolutely, resolutely embraced. Jeez, big words. In addition, Dr. Danny Boy has suggested a fifth element. Positive thought. Pointing out that their breathing, bathing, dining, and screwing brought about alibars and kudras much physical pleasure. And that an organism stepping in pleasure is an organism disposed to continue. Hmm. He has said that the will to live cannot be overestimated as a stimulant to longevity. Indeed, Dr. Danny Boy goes too far to s as to examine and to claim that 90% of all deaths are suicide. Persons say Wigs, who lack curiosity about life, who find minimal joy in the existence, are all too willing subconsciously to cooperate with and attract disease, accident, and violence. Enough for now, an urbanized technological society, that institutional home for the orphan of Pan. There may be few who can even relate anymore to the four elements, at least not in any primal sense. Velu Jackson, for example, once inquired about Madame de Vur in the four elements for something Motown Jive Group or something like that. While Ricky and the bartender define the four elements as cocaine, champagne, pussy, and chocolate. Paris, April, twilight. A few flat clouds folded themselves like crepes over fillings of apricot sky. Pompadours of super time smote billowed from chimneys, separating into the girlish pigtails of the breeze, combined the mount, combed the mount, the breeze it did, above the stale rooftops. Chestnut blossoms weary from having been admired all day or faint smiles of anticipation while the, their approach of the prime, private night. Or else the blossoms were being tickled by the sleepy insects that were entering them as if were, they were hotels. Stiff-legged corks squeaked loose from the bottlenecks where they stood guard since noon. Stiff-legged nags. Tiny harness bells jingling, dragging, dragging market carts towards the suburbs. As intervals along the boulevards, lamplighters set their gay fires. A wounded tongue licked the shine off cathedral domes. A bat broke loose from the belfry. A loaf broke loose from an oven. Six chimes broke loose from a clock. Everywhere, a huge enveloping softness. Soft as face powder. Soft as petticoats, soft as snuff in the courtine's box. Now the clock chimed seven times. Nightfall was almost complete. The softness was suddenly interrupted by harsh hoofbeats. Not four hooves, oddly enough, but two, striking a stone bridge, clink clink, upon which no beast could be seen to trod. 
and the peachy powdery softness was further violated by a release of fumes so fetid it seemed almost evil. Clank, clank. Sparks were struck from cobblestones. Clank, clank. To the innocent nostrils of spring, there was caterwauled a filthy serenade. Pan had waited until dark to return home so that he more stealthily transport the wig stolen from Descartes' redundant funeral. He'd not even since early morning had to scrape of his hooves not meant for city streets, and the blast of his stench meant for no place save the ruddering grounds were added stomach growls terrible and rude. From grass he had woven a short rope, which he tried tied to the wig so that the, he might pull it along beside him. In the dim light, those pedestrians who saw it scurrying up the street believed it to be blown along by the breeze. Several gave pursuit only to have it yanked away each time. They thought they had it in their grasp. One by one, they gave up. It stinks anyway, <laughs> said the last, to quiet the chase. <laughs> and Pan arrived at the incense shop with wig and tow, having painted a gentle April glooming of shades of Halloween. <laughs> so Pan's like pulling this wig that he stole from the carts. And uh, Pan's invisible, so everyone, and he stinks. And so everyone that sees the wig, they're trying to get it, but they're like, he stinks anyway, I don't want it. Poor Pan. Ceremoniously, Pan presented the wig. Frescoed now with grit and offal to Alabar. Were Alabar bewigged, Pan reasoned? He could hold the white hairs of age at bay for as long as he wished. And no outsider would be the wiser. With that pressure removed, maybe Alibar and Kudra would curtail their quanderings, maybe. The household would be merry again. Aw, he's trying to be nice. As it turned out, Pan found his host in a quite congeal mood already. When that afternoon, the latest candidate for a bass note had fallen short of expectations. They had sat down over a flagon of wine and, for, and negotiated an agreement to dematerialize. For a week, they fasted. They meditated for hours each day and bathed repeatedly. They made love between baths and re revisited climax, holding the orgasmic cyclone inside themselves, channeling it up their spinal columns into their brains. Then one afternoon, the greenish-bluish of April still upon the city, they closed the shop an hour early and then than usual and climb the stairs one of them for the last time oh shit they're about to dematerialize this is the part right here we're gonna we're gonna pause it page 178 we didn't get very far didn't even get 10 pages this is the right of the deep it's right like almost in the middle a little past the middle I didn't think that happened till the end. I just remembered, oh yeah, they go to America and all this stuff happens. Oh, it's a good part. It's a good part of the book. <laughs>